Elon Musk, as we all know, is utterly determined to reach this planet as soon as he possibly can, and to colonize it as quickly as mankind possibly can. He feels that it is utterly vital to the future of the human species to complete this process before the end of the century, or perhaps even before the end of his lifetime. But what do we do after this colonization is complete? Where do we go after that? Well, the next obvious destination is Jupiter, but certainly not here. Not where Io is located. This close to Jupiter would simply be insane. Not only in terms of the fact that this is one of the most violent worlds in the solar system, but also it is entirely too close to the king of the planets. At this distance, Jupiter's gravitational tides are so powerful that they've turned this tiny moon, which is technically too small to have a liquid core at all, into a seething volcanic hellhole with the most violent volcanoes anywhere in the solar system. It's amazing that gravity alone has been able to accomplish this, but gravity is not the greatest threat that Jupiter has to present to any visitors to this system. As as the Juno probe has discovered during its comprehensive exploration of the Jovian system. It is Jupiter's incredible magnetic field and the intense radiation that goes along with it that has represented the greatest threat to every unmanned probe that has visited Jupiter in the past and Juno in the present. But at the moment, Juno has made a close flyby of the moon of Ganymede, which of course is a considerable distance away from Jupiter, and it is, has a great deal of water ice and not a lot of volcanoes as Io does, it seems a bit more serene and less bombarded by radiation and intense gravitational tides. Might Ganymede be a safer place to visit, or do we have to go further out still? Well, when you look at one of the close-ups of this particular moon, it looks very much like our own natural satellite, pockmarked with craters and such, except for the strange grooves in the surface. And we must remember that the surface of this moon is entirely different than that of our own natural satellite, mostly comprised of water ice and not the materials that our own moon is comprised of, not the same silicates and other things that we would find valuable on our own moon, but at the same time, the water ice that would make a colony far more feasible. So does this mean that Ganymede should be a target for us, especially since it probably has a liquid water ocean, organic molecules, and the possible existence of life? We're going to find all of that out in just a moment. Good evening, and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So, we are still drifting around in the areas of futurism right now, not quite as far in the future as I did with my previous video when I was talking about interstellar travel, but rather, where do we go after Mars once we're established there? Now, I'm not saying that we need to completely terraform Mars or anything else before we move on. As a matter of fact, I think that the individuals who are bold enough to colonize the red planet are probably going to be interested in expanding further and taking advantage of opportunities further out into the solar system. And so there are a couple of obvious alternatives, one of them being Venus and its clouds. Uh, it's that area being fairly habitable, at least in terms of temperature, 
pressure, protection from radiation, that sort of thing, all of that being very attractive. The one problem that Venus has, among a couple of problems, is the fact that it has no water, as far as we know, except of what's bound together with sulfuric acid, which would be extremely difficult to harvest water out of sulfuric acid, although I'm sure we could probably manage it, but it would make for very, very tough going. I'm, in my opinion, it's easier to establish colonies in places where there's already water ice. The one thing that is so important to sustaining life, both in terms of drinking water and in terms of breathable atmosphere, both of these things being contained obviously in H2O. And the moons of Jupiter are an obvious source of these things. However, on the other side of the equation, Jupiter is an extremely long ways away way, even from Mars. Um, it's half a billion miles, uh, obviously a, an enormous distance uh, away from Earth, almost the same distance away from Mars, really still a colossal distance involved. But beyond the distance and the very, very cold temperatures of the moons of Jupiter, you also have a massive amount of radiation. Jupiter's magnetic field is something to be feared, um, as you're going to see here in the episode to come in the main part of the episode, Jupiter's magnetic field is truly amazing, and the radiation that this planet gives off is devastating. Um, on the closer moons of Jupiter, it makes Mars look like a picnic. The surface of Mars and the radiation that it receives is nothing compared to the radiation that moons like Io and Europa receive, really to the point to where colonizing either of those moons would be pretty much impractical, if not impossible. But does this mean that every moon of Jupiter is this way? Is the Jovian system completely off limits and we need to move on to Saturn? Well, no, not at all. And we're going to talk about all of this and one other particular issue that really pisses me off right now. On just about every level, the Jovian system is difficult to even reach, let alone colonize. I uh, sort of underestimated with my initial statement that it was half a billion miles away. It can get further than that. However, it can also get closer, as close as 588 million kilometers or 365 million miles, which by the way is 10 times further than the closest approach between Earth and Mars. For this reason, it makes a hell of a lot more sense to explore Jupiter from Mars than it does from Earth, mostly because of the 6 km per second difference in terms of escape velocity. Because of this difference, you can go from Mars to Jupiter for roughly the same delta V as you can go from Earth to Mars depending on your departure time. Of course, you need a very high delta V in order to accomplish this, and there's the matter of slowing down, but we'll get to that in a moment. Jupiter is colossal, more mass than everything else in the solar system combined, aside from the sun of course, and with all of that mass comes the most massive magnetic field in the solar system. It is enormous, so large that if you viewed it from the Earth, it would stretch across a span of sky larger than that of the full moon. Yes, even at that distance, it would be an amazing thing, and when the Voyager spacecraft first visited Jupiter, it was discovered that Jupiter's magnetic field was so colossal that it stretched all the way past the orbit of Saturn, or at least we think it does. And here's the cosmic rays and radiation at the surface of Mars. As you can see, if you were to stand, say, right here for a period of a year, you would absorb about 14 rems. Now, 100 rems gives you about a 5% increase increased chance of developing cancer over the course of your life. 5%. So this radiation that we're supposed to be so terrified of would be very different at Jupiter. 
How different? Well, over the course of its entire mission, the Juno probe is expected to absorb 2 million rems worth of radiation from this magnetic field. 2 million! Enough to completely reduce a human being to a puddle of dying flesh in a matter of seconds. In order to survive this, Juno's electronics are protected inside a titanium trunk about the size of an SUV trunk, about one centimeter in thickness, and it protects its brain and its data distribution system and about 20 other electronic assemblies. The whole vault weighs about 200 kilograms and is only one square meter in size. We would not have the luxury of this kind of armored protection, not if we wanted to make our ship light enough in order to make the journey in an acceptable amount of time. So how the hell would we survive? Well, you certainly wouldn't survive this close. Io is not only a hellhole, but a radioactive hellhole, receiving 3,600 rems per day. Enough radiation to kill you within a half an hour. It's an insane amount of radiation making approaching this moon an insane proposition. However, an unmanned expedition could actually get something out of this moon in theory. In a paper linked in the description, Dr. Thomas Kerwick points out that the total thermal energy from Io is in the range of 100 trillion watts, which if it could be harnessed, say perhaps by thermal panels such as the ones we use to harness solar thermal energy, which of course would be something like a mini Dyson sphere, something that we could build perhaps somewhere in the next couple centuries, the amount of energy that we could harness from this moon would be beyond description, really. Enough energy, certainly, to power any of the stations that would exist on any of the Jovian moons, plus perhaps produce enough energy to propel Dr. Loeb's breakthrough Starshot initiative to send probes to other stars. It's a lot of energy. Sadly, radiation represents a significant problem on Europa as well. 540 rems per day or enough to kill you within less than 24 hours. This is simply too much for human beings to look at surviving unless they were to perhaps duck Europa's radiation, which is possible given that the majority of it is received on the trailing edge of Europa because of the way Jupiter's magnetic field works. The idea would be to land on a portion of Europa that does not receive as much radiation and then burrow inside the ice as quickly as possible. However, this seems incredibly risky and really not worth it given the potential of just using robotic mechanisms to achieve the same thing when you're looking for life on Europa, which seems extremely possible given recent studies. For example, Infrared studies of the mysterious cracks on the surface of Europa have revealed that they correspond to the same signatures of various types of extremophile bacteria here on Earth. The similarity is almost too precise. Now, some scientists have argued that this staining could have been caused by various types of salts. However, those salts on other moons, like Enceladus, for example, tend to be white, not the brownish color that exists on Europa. Others have argued that it might be sulfur deposits left over from Io, and this does indeed happen on Europa. However, one would expect that these deposits would be more evenly distributed and distributed on the trailing edge of Europa, where it receives all of the sulfur from Io, not equally distributed only in the cracks. Thus far, Europa seems an extremely likely candidate for life off our own planet. Planet. But unfortunately, because of the radiation, robotic missions seem to be the most prudent way of exploring this world. However, robotic missions controlled almost in real time from a safer moon of the Jovian system would make a great deal of sense. The question is, does a safe moon actually exist? 
Well, now we come to Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system with a gravitational pull slightly greater than that of our own moon and something that Martian explorers would have a much easier time adapting to, both in terms of living there and also possibly returning to Mars, assuming that they only stayed for a year or two and exercised regularly. It would be a very doable thing for a variety of reasons. At a distance of over a million million kilometers from Jupiter, Ganymede receives a hell of a lot less radiation than Io or Europa, but still quite a bit. 8 rems of radiation per day if you were unshielded. This is still not entirely too much. Remember, Martian radiation is supposed to be problematic because you'd receive 14 rems worth of radiation per year, not 8 rems per day. Although personally, I think Martian radiation is completely overblown. Remember that 100 rems is only supposed to represent a 5% increase in your chance of developing cancer, which means standing unprotected on the surface of Mars for years, which you wouldn't do by the way, would only result in a 5% increase, but nevertheless, Ganymede would definitely be problematic if you were unshielded. But there are some very good solutions involving the use of water ice that would provide you with shielding without having to burrow under the surface of Ganymede. And one of these solutions is something called the Mars Ice House. As a result of a competition that NASA came up with years ago, something that I've talked about a number of times, about a 3D printed habitat on the surface of Mars that would provide surface living together with natural light on top of radiation protection. Now this is a double walled enclosure for additional insulation from the outside, which would be important because the surface the surface of Ganymede is incredibly cold, far colder than Mars as a matter of fact, and on top of that, it also has an exterior coating of several centimeters of ice that provides almost complete protection from the levels of radiation we're talking about on the surface of Ganymede as well as Mars. And of course, the ice on Ganymede would never melt, and on top of that, Ganymede is the only moon in the solar system to have its own magnetic field, indicating that the radiation in the surface may not be as severe as we think. And of course, on top of this, it also has silicates and iron suitable for mining and construction, so there's lots of advantages to this particular moon. However, given that you would want to stay inside, the vast majority of the time because of the radiation. You would want a habitat that would allow you to see out for psychological reasons amongst many others and have a look at the surface view that one would have from Ganymede. The view of Jupiter would be utterly breathtaking. But perhaps the most exciting thing about Ganymede is the fact that it has not one, but perhaps several liquid oceans, one on top of another, with several separated ecosystems, with perhaps several different types of life forms, each one having evolved separately of the others. And yet, Ganymede may not be the ideal place for a colony, but instead there is one more moon, and that is Callisto. At a distance of 2 million kilometers from Jupiter, radiation is hardly an issue on Callisto, believe it or not. A little over 3.5 rems per year, or substantially less than you would get on the surface of Mars. The radiation you would get from the Sun and from cosmic rays would be more problematic. You would still need some sort of radiation-proof shelter, but wandering out on the surface of Callisto would be a lot less problematic. Plus, Callisto has the same iron ores and silicate resources and other resources that would be valuable to as far as a mining colony is concerned, and also a subsurface water ocean and organic molecules with the suggestion of life existing beneath the surface. 
And there would be another reason to wander out onto the surface of Callisto. These mysterious ice spires that tower as high as a hundred meters or the same as a 30-story building. I can't imagine gazing at something like this. Icebergs that colossal on a tiny moon way out in the reaches of the outer solar system. And not only that, seeing Jupiter in the heavens a full eight times the size of the full moon. Living on this moon would be harsh, but a remarkable and stunning adventure for anybody who wanted to make the trip. How would you make the trip? Well, chemical rockets would be a real problem. Achieving the necessary delta V to arrive at Jupiter in a year or less. Plus, decelerating at Jupiter would be incredibly difficult unless you used the atmosphere to aerobrake and then take a huge dose of radiation in the process. But this rocket that you're looking at right now, which is called the Hope, uses an entirely different type of propulsion called Vasimir. This system utilizes intensely powerful radio waves to ionize and heat an inert type of fuel and then accelerate it out the nozzle utilizing powerful magnetic fields at relativistic speeds. This type of engine would easily allow transitions from Mars to Jupiter in a year or perhaps as little as six months, including the deceleration. And the descent vehicle that you're looking at right now is very similar to one designed by the ESA, designed to create a habitat on the surface of the moon that would also work for Callisto. But this type of propulsion requires immense amounts of energy and probably won't be practical until we master fusion. However, colonizing the Jupiter system is something that we're unlikely to do for the next several decades anyway. And there's another huge barrier to colonization besides just radiation and propulsion. And that's the concept of contaminating whatever life might exist on these moons. There is a huge huge prevailing idea in the scientific community that we should have a hands-off policy on any of these locations until we determine what sort of life exists there. And if there is life, then we should not go there. And that is absolute bullshit. This type of thinking is not only dangerous, it is suicidal. If we remain restricted to our own planet, if having discovered that life exists on just about every other habitable body in the solar system, which may very well be the case, we are committing suicide as a species. Our civilization needs to spread out throughout the solar system, otherwise we will continue destroying the environment that birthed us. This is completely absurd and must be dismissed as quickly as possible. If mankind is to survive, we must not only colonize the red planet, but look to the rest of the solar system as well, with a cautious view, definitely, and with an eye to protecting the life that exists on these worlds as we colonize them, but not to avoid them completely at the cost of our own planet and everything that lives there. Now look, I need to make one thing abundantly clear as always. I do not believe, in spite of the things that I may have said in the course of this video, that we need to colonize other worlds willy-nilly without any concern whatsoever for whatever life may be there. And by the way, I do believe that life is very abundant in the solar system. I think that once we've actually gone there in person and once exobiology have stopped being so narrow-minded about all of this stuff, we are going to start discovering life on Mars, Enceladus, Europa, Titan, anywhere that there is the potential for liquid water and the other elements, organic molecules, etc., that make life possible. We are going to find that life is as natural of a development, as I've said many times, as natural of a development in the formation of a solar system as gravity and everything that it does in order to form solar systems in the first place. 
all of it goes hand in glove. And that being said, we should not just destroy it in the process of expanding out into the solar system. I certainly believe that. But at the same time, the whole notion of a hands-off policy for fear of contaminating these places, oh, so what do we do then? We just stay restricted to our own planet and continue this mass extinction that we've been you know, going hell bent on for the last several centuries, destroying countless species, and I do mean countless, because there are so many species of creatures across this planet that we don't even know existed that we have extinguished in the history of our species and our dominance over this planet. Do we want to just continue with that behavior instead until we have annihilated this entire planet? Of course not. We have to expand outward and do so with caution and do so maybe setting up preserves on these planets. Hell, maybe even set up entire hemispheres that are reserved for the natural life that exists on this, these planets and these moons. By all means, protect it. But that doesn't mean that we can't go there at all. And we must dismiss any notions that we cannot go there. Because I believe very strongly that any bacterial life or any form of life that is capable of surviving the extremely harsh conditions on Mars or on any of the Jovian moons is capable of surviving anything biological that we can throw at it. And yeah, this sounds a whole lot like Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos's idea there, I think that's a really good idea. It's not what he's doing, but yeah, I think that that is a really noble idea and what we should be doing as a species and as a civilization. Do so responsibly, but at the same time, don't do so at the cost of our own species and our own planet for the sake of protecting life elsewhere. I think that a balance approach can be struck, a compromise can be struck as we expand out into the solar system, but only time will tell, and there are many who disagree with my point of view, but I'll be happy to debate it until the end. But nevertheless, I also believe that Martians are going to be the ones who are doing this exploring. As I mentioned in the video, because they're accustomed to one-third gravity, because they're accustomed to harsh conditions in the first place, they are the ones who are going to be the most likely to expand further to Jupiter, to the moons of Saturn, etc. They'll also, of course, be able to adapt to the gravitational shifts a lot easier. They'll never be able to go back to Earth, um, you know, barring some sort of medical breakthrough. But I don't think they're going to care. I think that they will be driven to expand out into the solar system and the wonders that await them more than they're going to have a yearning to return home. But that's just my own view, and I'd be interested to hear some other opinions. If you like the way I put things, if you like my opinionated way of reporting on these issues, then by all means, support me any way that you can. Um, there are, of course, many ways to support me, including getting your own starship, your own crew dragon from Spaceship Mania. It's all in the description. And use the code ANGRY15 for a 15% discount. So, until we have colonized the Red Planet and those colonists are eager to expand further, to increase man's knowledge and man's civilization until we have colonized the entire solar system and are beginning to look even further to our neighboring star systems, I urge all of you to stay angry about space!